Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here today. We hope you had a very pleasant and joyous celebration of Christ's birth this past week. Uh, I think things went pretty well here at St. John's regarding our Christmas services under the circumstances. Obviously, things are very, very different. Our, we had four services. All of them were full uh, to capacity. So we had about 290 people total that-wise. Uh, usually on a regular year, we'd have around 500. Um, but when I went and looked online, we did have 118 uh, views of the worship service that we had recorded. We don't know how many people watch any of those views, uh, so it's impossible for us to know. But we got the gospel message out uh, in a number of ways, and that's been, that was exciting. So we thank God uh, for the good things that happened here at Christmas, and we continue to celebrate it uh, even to this day, uh, obviously. Okay, uh, this week uh, will be a quiet week here at St. John's. Uh, there is no Sunday school or Bible class today, as we've told you before. Uh, and the office will be open Monday and Tuesday, and that's going to be it. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we're, we're closed. Uh, so we're just going to take a couple of days off and, and relax a little bit here as well. Next Sunday, next Sunday, we'll be celebrating the Epiphany. The Epiphany, of course, marks the visit of the wise men to the infant Jesus. So when you come next week, this will look a little different. Uh, the shepherds will be gone, the angel will be gone. Instead, we'll have the wise men and the camels up here uh, instead. And then next week, also, we will have Sunday school again. And the kids are going to make uh, the last portion, then, of their nativity scenes, which will be the wise men and the camels. And then they'll be able to take those home uh, next Sunday, then, as well, and add them as the wise men come to worship Jesus, too. Uh, the Bible class next week uh, will be led by Pastor Justin. Uh, he'll be leading the Bible class throughout the month of January uh, on the book of Acts, on a particular portion of the book of Acts. So uh, join us for that. Next, in January, I'm going to be going down with the Sunday school kids uh, and spend some time with them uh, that month. Okay, so that's the plan. Uh, today we will be singing uh, in the worship service. Uh, we don't have any recorded music planned and we don't have any singers, so you guys are the singers again, uh, just like we did at Christmas. The uh, only thing we do ask is that when you sing, you keep the mask on uh, as we need to do, okay? So we're going to begin our worship today with the hymn, Now Sing, We Now Rejoice, and it's a privilege to have Audrey back played organ. Audrey's not played organ since the first Sunday in November, uh, and I, I remember when Connie finally came back, there was no one happier than Audrey. Uh, well, right now I can tell you there's no one happier than Connie, <laughs> uh, that Audrey's back. So it really worked out timing-wise here. God is all in control. Uh, so we're, we're very happy about that. So uh, after Audrey introduces the first hymn, we will stand and sing, Now Sing We Now Rejoice. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord ha has made his salvation known. He has revealed his righteousness to the nations. A light for revelation to the Gentiles. 
that we may rejoice in the God of our salvation. Let us confess our sins to him and receive his forgiveness. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Be merciful to us. And forgive us our sins, O Jesus. From all evil, from all sin, from your wrath, from the snares of the devil, and from everlasting death, deliver us, O Jesus. Through the mystery of your holy incarnation, nativity, holy life, agony and passion, cross, death and burial, resurrection and ascension, deliver us, O Jesus. O Jesus, hear us. Hear us, O Jesus. The Lord has revealed salvation to us. Christ was born. Christ has died. Christ is risen. He has earned for you pardon, freedom, and life. Therefore, in his name and as a called and ordained servant, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to God in the with the next verse. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together. O oh God, you make us glad by the yearly festival of the birth of your only begotten Son, Jesus the Christ. Grant that we who joyfully see him as our Redeemer will with sure confidence behold him when he comes to be our judge, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And would you now please be seated? Our first scripture reading for today is from Galatians chapter 4. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. This is the word of the Lord. Our second scripture reading is from Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. This is the word of the Lord. And our gospel reading for today is from Luke chapter 2. When the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, 
This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. This is the Gospel of the Lord. As a children's message today, um, we're going to talk about two more people. Two more people that are part of the greater Christmas story. But those two people are not pictured up here in this nativity scene. The reason for that, of course, is that this is in Bethlehem. And this was just a one night kind of thing. That's all that this was. One night, the angel was gone, the shepherds went back to the fields, Mary and Joseph were in the stable that night, to be sure, but probably, we don't know for sure, but probably the next day, Joseph went and found some place where they could stay, and they were in a house after that. So the whole thing with the manger and everything else uh, is pretty much a one-night kind of thing. The story that we have for today takes place 40 days after Jesus is born. 40 days. So Jesus is a month and a half old, and at that time, Mary and Joseph took Jesus to Jerusalem. Remember, this is Bethlehem, going to Jerusalem. That's a totally different city. Jerusalem is the capital city. Bethlehem's just a little, little town. It's the capital city, and in Jerusalem is the temple. The temple was the place of worship for the Jewish people. And on that day, as they took Jesus to Jerusalem, two people, two people came up to Jesus. I should say they came up to Mary and Joseph, but they were holding Jesus, and the real one that they wanted to see was, in fact, Jesus. Jesus is just a baby. He's only a month and a half old. But one of the people was a man by the name of Simeon. Simeon had been told by God a real special thing. Simeon was a very faithful man. He really believed, and he trusted God completely. And he was just into God's word so very much that God told him, Simeon, before you die, you are going to see the Christ. You're going to see the Savior. You're going to see him with your own eyes. So you, Simeon, you hang around here at the temple. You hang around here because you don't know what day it's going to be, but someday it's going to happen. You will see the Christ. There was another person there at the temple, a lady by the name of Anna. Anna was an older lady. She could have been about 84 years old, as a matter of fact. She was a widow, but she too, she just hung on to God's word so completely it helped her in her struggles. It focused everything. It gave her hope. It gave her hope, this promise that the Christ was going to come. Now, most likely, Simeon and Anna knew each other. And they probably talked. And they, they built each other up in this good news that God was going to send the Savior of the world. And then Simeon, of course, said, and I've even been told, I've even been told that I'm going to see him with my own eyes. So that's why I have to wait here. And then came that day. Then came that day, 40 days after Jesus was born, that Mary and Joseph walked into the temple courts. They didn't know what was going to happen. But the Holy Spirit went and told Simeon, Simeon, go over there. Go to that young man and that lady carrying a baby. He's the one. You can imagine Simeon just, whoa! Whoa! This is incredible. And Anna was right there. She came right along. She came right along. And the two of them went up to baby Jesus. 
And Simeon took the baby in his arms and lifted him up in praise and thanksgiving. This was the promised child. This was the Savior who had come. Simeon even said, my eyes have seen your salvation. Remember, salvation means Savior. The name Jesus means the Lord saves. Jesus was coming to save his people from sin, and Simeon held him in his arms. Oh, my. What a thrill. What a privilege. What an honor. And Anna, and Anna was right there. And I don't know if she held the baby Jesus or not. Maybe, I don't know. It doesn't tell us in the Bible. But she looked, and she too was filled with amazement. God was fulfilling his promise. The Savior had come. Those two people are very important because what they did afterwards. What they did afterwards is that they told everyone. Anyone who would listen to them, right there in the temple courts, they told them, there he is, the Savior's come. He's here, just like God said. He was born in Bethlehem, his mother's Mary. Some people maybe believed, but unfortunately most of them kind of thought the two people were crazy. That's what happens a lot of times with this truth about Jesus. Even today people think you're crazy for believing in Jesus. But that did not stop Simeon and it did not stop Anna. And they kept telling. The shepherds went and told everyone too the night that Jesus was born. And now 40 days later, Simeon and Anna are telling everyone. And we're so glad because over the years, many years, 2,000 years, one person told another, told another, told another, told another. And that's how come we know about Jesus today. How come you're being told about Jesus? Just like Simeon and Anna tell this good news, just like the shepherds tell the good news, so also we tell the good news that a Savior, he's come in the flesh. It's Jesus. Amen. Let's confess what we believe about this Savior, Jesus, by St. Luther's explanation of the second article of the Creed. Let's stand to say that. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocence, suffering, and death that I may be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. You may be seated for the next hymn, which we will sing. In his temple now behold him.
And grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, so why did Mary and Joseph go to Jerusalem? Okay, what was that all about? Just to get the chronology down once again, Jesus born, obviously, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. And then eight days later, eight days later, he was circumcised. And that's when he was officially given his name, Jesus. That was the custom of those days. Now, he was officially given his name, Jesus, by the angel while Mary was still pregnant. But now it became public that his name is Jesus. And he had been circumcised, shed his blood, first drops of blood shed for the salvation of the world, okay? Uh, That happened eight days. Then on the 40th day of Jesus' life, they went to Jerusalem. The reason for 40 days was this. According to the Jewish law, a woman who gave birth was unclean for seven days, which meant that she was supposed to stay in seclusion. Uh, She was not supposed to see anyone. No people are supposed to come and visit. It was indeed intended by God as a kind of a, just a health kind of a deal uh, back in those days, but also a time to bond with their child and, and so on and so forth, okay? Then after that, for another 33 days, the woman was considered ceremonially unclean, which meant that she was not supposed to go to the temple. Not until day 40 would she be allowed to come into the temple courts. So day 40, Mary has now gone through the purification rites of the Jewish people, and she is going to Jerusalem in order to be go through the rite of purification, which meant that she'll add an offering to bring. Uh, In most cases, it would be the offering of a lamb, but if you couldn't afford a lamb, it'd be two pigeons or two young doves. That's what Mary and Joseph brought as an offering, a thank offering for preserving Mary uh, throughout the pregnancy and a safe delivery, and then also, of course, as a thanksgiving for the birth of the child, okay? So that was done for Mary, but then there was something more, and this is the more important thing for our consideration that on the 40th day, the firstborn son of every family was to be presented to the Lord and offered to the Lord for full-time service to the Lord. And when I say full-time service, that was to be a priest, offered to be a priest to the Lord. Okay? That's what's happening here. This is the presentation of Jesus. He's the firstborn in that family. Mary and Joseph are taking him to the temple. They do the purification rites for Mary, but then they do this other thing, which is, like I said, the more significant thing for us, which is the presentation. They bring Jesus to offer him to God. Now, where did this all come from? This becomes the key thing. If we, we need to understand this. We need to understand this if we're gonna get the full picture of it. This whole thing about offering your firstborn son to full-time service to the Lord started at the time of the Exodus. Okay, so we gotta go back. Go back to Egypt. Go back to the time of Moses. Go back to the day of Passover. Remember Passover? Tenth plague. God's going to send the angel to put to death the firstborn son in every household throughout the land of Egypt. Even the firstborn of the animals put them all to death because of his anger upon the Egyptians. The Israelites were told very specifically that they could be saved from that death if they were to take a lamb, to offer the lamb as a sacrifice, paint the blood on the doorposts of the, ho- of the doors of the homes on which they would eat the Passover that night, so that then when the angel saw the blood, he would pass over their house and the firstborn child would live, not die. The child lived because the lamb died. The child lived because the substitute died. Now, because of that, this was Exodus chapter 12, by the way. In Exodus chapter 13, it's right there, this very same time, God says, now because I have done what I have done, 
Namely, I by grace and a free gift have spared your sons, your firstborn sons, they're all alive because of the lamb. Now I want them to serve me. I want them to serve me. And not just these who were in the homes in Egypt with the blood on the doors, but for all generations, for all generations, I want these firstborn to serve me in my house, to be priests, to do the kinds of things, particularly the sacrifices, particularly the sacrifices that are required. Your children, your firstborn children are alive because of the sacrifices. And I want this to continue for generation after generation after generation. And it's the firstborn son that is going to do this. That's how God set this up. Now over the course of time, and it wasn't too long, there was actually a little bit of a switch because God wanted to emphasize something more. He wanted to emphasize something a little bit more. Yes, obviously, emphasize salvation from death by the blood of the Lamb. It becomes very obvious and a wonderful, incredible reminder if your firstborn son has to be given over to the Lord. It becomes a real clear reminder of why this is happening. Because of God's grace. Saving from sin and death and slavery. Slavery. Like to a Pharaoh, but greater to Satan. So it was a wonderful reminder, wonderful reminder. But again, God wanted something more, something more. So God kind of changed things a little bit and said, this is what we're going to do. Instead of having the firstborn of every family throughout Egypt be my servants and serve as priests, you know, for me, before me, we're going to do this. I'm going to take all of the tribe of Levi, and every male that is born in the tribe of Levi will be my priest, will be my servants. And all the rest of the tribes can be free to buy back, to buy back their sons from me with the price of redemption. Okay, we've got to think about this a little bit. The word redeem means to buy back that which was your own. Not just go and buy something new, but something that was yours, but for whatever reason has been separated from you, you pay another price to get it back. To get it back. Okay? It was very specific to teach what God had to do what God had to do to save you and me. He had to redeem us. He had to pay the price to buy us back. We were his. He created us, and then we sinned. And what, is, what do we always say sin does? Sin separates us from God. Therefore, in order to get us back to him, he had to redeem us. He had to buy us back again. Now, what was the price that had to be paid? Well, it was foreshadowed by that lamb that was, all those lambs, I should say, that were sacrificed in Egypt on that night when death was imminent. The price was blood of an innocent one. An innocent lamb. This, of course, is all pointing to Jesus himself. You know that. You got that point. But here's the redemption part that comes in very specifically when Jesus was presented on day 40 of his life. Because this is what they all had to do. The firstborn son was to be presented to the Lord and offered for service. But now you've got a substitute that's already doing that, namely of the tribe of Levi. Okay, so now you come and you present your son to the Lord. But then you do this. You buy him back. And do you know what the cost of the buying back was? Five shekels. 
Five shekels was just a very small amount of money. A couple of bucks, if you want to look at it that way. Mary and Joseph that day, very specifically, went to the temple. They presented Jesus before the Lord, and that could very well have been with Simeon with the whole deal. And then, in order to get them back, Joseph reached into his wallet or whatever he had, and he pulled out five shekels and said, here. Simeon, or if it was a priest or someone else, whoever, we don't know, took the money, and they got Jesus back. This was done with every single household that had a firstborn son. It was to remind them about Egypt, about the lamb that saves from death and gives life, and the price of redemption. But the price of redemption, obviously, is not money. It's blood. It's really cool that you just confessed. In the words of Martin Luther's explanation of the Second Article Creed, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. This ultimately is why this Jesus has come. He himself is, is under the law. That's what Galatians said today. Jesus is under the law. So he's presented to the Lord. Joseph pulls out his five shekels. He gets Jesus back. But that very Jesus is come to pay the real price. That monetary transaction, if you want to call it that, was just a little foreshadowing of the real price of redemption. The price that was going to be paid by Jesus himself. That's why Simeon and Anna marveled. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people. This is the one who's going to pay the price of our redemption. It said very specifically that Anna spoke about, spoke to everyone who was looking forward to the redemption of Israel. The word is right there in Luke chapter 2. The redemption, the price that was going to be paid. You can almost hear her saying, you can almost hear her saying, he's the one who's going to pay the price. He's the redeemer. He's the one who is going to shed his blood. In fact, Simeon very specifically alluded to it in his little conversation that's recorded for us in the book of Luke, the little conversation with Mary, in particular of Joseph, of course, was right there. This child is meant for the rising and the falling of many in Israel. Some will believe in him, many won't. Some will be lifted up from their sins and their death because of his, his grace. Others are going to trip over him like a rock. It says he will be a sign that will be spoken against. And he, oh, I forget how the next phrase went. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's been a long week. Um, just one second. Just one second. I forgot what the next phrase says. And a sign that will be spoken against. Simple enough. And a sign that will be spoken against. Just think what's going to happen right there in the temple courts in 33 years. When the scribes and the Pharisees and many others join in accusing him of blasphemy. So much so that they'll put him on a cross. That they will put him on a cross Simeon's already alluding to it. A sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of of many hearts will be revealed. It'll be clear who the believers are and who the sinners continue to be. We talked about all that in the sermons just before Advent began. That's what Simeon's talking about. And it's right there. 
It's literally right there in the temple courts. And then Jesus even said to Mary, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. He prophesied at that very moment the grief that would come upon Mary as she stood beneath the cross of Jesus on that Good Friday, which was probably just a few hundred yards away from the spot where they stood that day, the day of presentation. Sad, tragic, full of grace. (laughs) That's what this is. That's what this is. This is all about God coming to save. Simeon will, will declare, this is the light that enlightens everyone, enlightens the Gentiles, the glory of the people of Israel. Yes, this is God's glory, that God has come in the flesh and he's willing to lay down his life, pay the ransom, pay the redemption price so that you and I and all people can be saved. So just another part of the the Christmas event, something to take to heart and to understand and to treasure and to give glory to God. His great grace has come to us, a grace of boundless joy of everlasting life. May it be yours forever. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. And we'll continue with our prayers here for today. You may remain seated. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to be our savior, our salvation, to pay redemption's price. And it was a whole lot more than just five shekels. He gave his blood hanging on the cross as the lamb who takes away sin, the lamb who brings victory over death, the lamb that brings release from captivity. We see that happening and foreshadowed already here when Jesus was presented at the temple. We rejoice that you've caused this to be written for our learning And we marvel that over the centuries, you have this all laid out so that we can understand and appreciate and take to heart what Jesus has done for us. We thank you for the celebration that we are currently having, the celebration of Christmas. But really, we celebrate your grace each and every day of our lives. So keep us strong and steadfast in our faith. Help us to share this by word and deed with so many others. And through us and through all Christians around the world, may your name be glorified and your truth, your gospel message be shared, proclaimed, and believed. Heavenly Father, we ask your continuing to blessing to be upon our country and upon all who are dealing with COVID. We thank you very, very much that the numbers here in Minnesota are going down. We're grateful for that. We pray that they stay that way and continue to decline even more. We pray that the vaccines that are now being distributed will be very effective and that they'll be available widely very, very soon. Help us all to continue to to keep up the measures that we need to to keep this disease under control. And for all who are suffering from it, we truly pray that their cases will be minor and that they will be still held in good health. For those that have to be hospitalized, we thank you for the care of the medical teams that attend to them. They're doing such great work and they're so overloaded. We truly pray that you give them strength and stamina and the understanding and encouragement to know that they do your work, and it's like very, very good work. On the other hand, we also pray for those who are dying. We pray for those who are grieving. Literally thousands of people every single day in our country are dying. We pray that you comfort them with your peace, with the truth that you, dear Jesus, have defeated the power of death, and by faith in you have granted life to all who believe. Lord God, we therefore pray for all who have uh, COVID-19. We think about Delbert Schatz in particular uh, and others that we know and name in our hearts. We also ask for your continuing blessings to be with Dorothy Shepherd as she's at the care center uh, now uh, and will will certainly be for quite a while. We pray that you help her uh, to rest secure in your arms and that the wound, the infection that she has will be healed. And then we pray for Jeff Davis. Uh, He had surgery on Thursday uh, to deal with continuing effects of a 
truck accident that he had last May. We truly pray that uh, the surgery will be completely successful, that as he heals, uh, his neck will be strengthened, uh, and he'll be able to continue to uh, do the things that he has been made to do. We continue to pray for Lyndon Luke and Liam Kiefer, Patty Himesness, Suzanne Lewis, Mason Mealham, and Teal Olson, all of whom have been treated with cancer. We pray for the other people we name in our hearts who have debilitating diseases and conditions that, that require your special care. We also ask for your blessing to be with Corinne Brown as she's receiving hospice care. Be with all of us, dear God, this most holy season. May the truth of, your, of our redemption by the blood of Jesus Christ be our hope, our peace, and our joy. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you all now please stand as we prepare to receive the Lord's Supper? <clears throat> the Lord be with you. And Lord also with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift, lift them, them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is good right that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For out of love you gave us the gift of your only Son. He is the revelation of grace, the gift of salvation, and the glory of your presence. Therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Jesus, we celebrate with, truth, with joy the truth that you took upon yourself human form and came into this world to save us. Today you give us the special gifts of your very body and blood under the forms of bread and wine to eat and to drink. Bless us to receive these gifts in faith for the forgiveness of our sins, life in your name, and our everlasting salvation. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Would you all now please be seated.
You all now please stand. Now may this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. praise you, O God, as our eyes have seen your salvation in Jesus Christ. In this sacrament, you have given us his body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins and the strengthening of our faith. You now dismiss us in peace that we may serve you faithfully all our days in the light of your grace. Amen. Would you now please be seated?
As this is our last service for this year, 2020, as I'm sure all of you are ready to be done with 2020, uh, we're going to be doing a New Year's reflection to mark the end of this year and the beginning of the next. As we approach the close of another year, even one as challenging as this, we look back upon it and to carry forward its joys and blessings into the new year. Thank you, Lord, for the goodness you have shown to us in the year now ending. You have blessed us in many ways, and you have sustained us in times of trouble and difficulty, in ways we cannot ever fully appreciate. We now sing our God, our help in ages past. As we begin a new, in a new year, we are reminded that we are God's redeemed saints. We forge ahead in this new year, not in bondage, but in freedom. No longer in futility and fear, but persevering in hope that does not disappoint us. Hear the word of God from Romans chapter 8. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all, how will he also, not also along with him graciously give us all things? For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Would you all now please stand with me as we pray together? God of all time and eternity, the Alpha and Omega, we commit to you the year now completed and commend to your kindness and love the year now at hand. Through the coming days, weeks, and months, encourage us by your Spirit to make wise use of your word and sacraments that we may be thoroughly strengthened in our faith, that we may live each day to your glory. Ground us in the love, grace, and mercy of Christ our Lord, in whose wondrous name we commence this new year. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his favor upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Today and always, the Lord blesses his people with peace. May I sing, let us all with gladsome voice. You may be seated. We thank you again for joining us uh, here today. I don't have anything else to say except a happy new year to all of you. Go in peace.